Throughout the history of naval warfare, it has been common practice to absorb a captured enemy vessel into one's own fleet, bolstering numbers and replacing losses. A common occurrence in the days of great sailing vessels where they fired cannonballs at one another, but with the invention of high explosive shells, often captured enemy vessels were too damaged during the fight to be of use to anyone. However, there have been exceptions. In today's episode, we will hear the story of how a German U-boat, the terror of the Allied convoys, found itself hoisting the white ensign of the Royal Navy and joining the campaign against Nazi ambitions at sea. This is the story of the Royal Navy's U-boat. Welcome to Wars of the World. For the German Kriegsmarine, war had come earlier than they had anticipated, and despite possessing a modern and relatively advanced naval force in 1939, they were nonetheless outnumbered by the British and French in terms of surface ships. Therefore, remembering the effectiveness of the Kaiser's U-boat fleet in the previous war, in which Britain was very nearly starved into submission as food, fuel, and war materials from overseas were torpedoed at will, Hitler decided to adopt a similar policy and instigated a massive U-boat construction program. Upon the outbreak of the war, Germany had 57 ocean-going U-boats, but by the end of 1940, that number would have almost doubled, while in 1941 alone, nearly four times that number would be built. However, while Germany built excellent U-boats, as the adage dictates, a weapon is only as good as the person wielding it. A U-boat could be built and launched a lot faster than a sailor could gain vital experience sailing in one. And so, with ever more numbers of boats being built and needing crews, more sailors with little or no experience were being sent to crew them. It was believed that by spreading the experienced officers and senior non-commissioned ranks among the fleet, they could instill their experience on the new U-boat men. But this wasn't always the case, as typified in the story of U-570. Launched on March 20th, 1941, U-570 would have a short career. Looking every bit the German U-boat, she was a member of the Type 7 class, and with 703 examples being built in several variants, this remains the most numerous class of submarine ever built. As Type 7C, she was armed with 14 torpedoes, a single 8.8cm SKC-35 naval deck gun, and with an operational range of 8,500 miles on diesel power. The threat U-570 and its class presented to the Allied convoys could not be understated. Commanded by 31-year-old Hans Ramlow, the sub's crew were assembled and quickly run through their training during the summer of 1941, so they could join the war effort as swiftly as possible. The crew of the U-570 typified the growing brain drain amongst German submariners, as the U-boat corps swelled, with the vast majority being fresh out of their basic naval training before joining the boat. Inexperience on U-boats extended to the captain, for while Ramlow had served in the German Navy for 13 years, he had only recently transferred to the U-boat corps, and had conducted only one training cruise above U-58 in April of 1941 before being given command of U-570. Instructors did their best to prepare them, but of course, training only takes men so far. Finally, on August 24, 1941, it was time for U-570 and her inexperienced crew to cut their teeth against the Allies. German intelligence believed that a large concentration of Allied merchant ships would be passing south of Iceland in the coming days, and U-570 was to join 15 other U-boats that would be hunting for them. Sailing from its base in occupied Norway, the U-boat was crammed with supplies for a four-week voyage, but the journey was a dangerous one. 
The U-boat traveled for much of the journey into the North Sea on the surface, using its diesel engines to keep the batteries charged for when it was time to dive. However, this ran the risk of detection by roaming RAF maritime patrol aircraft from Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Iceland. On the morning of August 27th, U-570 would meet this danger head-on when an RAF Lockheed Hudson Maritime Patrol aircraft of number 269 Squadron spotted the marauding German U-boat and attacked. However, luck was on Ramlow and his men's side, as the depth charges failed to release from their racks, leaving the U-boat to escape undamaged by diving into the murky waters below. The danger having passed, the incident gave Ramlow an excuse to keep the U-boat submerged, in order to give some of his crew a reprieve from seasickness, which many of them had succumbed to from riding on the choppy surface. At around 1050 hours, Ramlow decided it was time to surface and recharge the batteries. That look which had saved his U-boat earlier in the day would now evaporate in spectacular fashion, for having first scanned the region through the periscope and not seeing any vessels, U-570 surfaced almost immediately underneath another Hudson from the same squadron as the earlier aircraft. It wasn't until Ramlow was climbing through the hatch to the bridge and he heard the growl of the Hudson's right engines that he realized the danger they were in. Scrambling back below, he ordered the U-boat to crash dive, but before it could escape, U-570 was rocked by four explosions in the water around it from a stick of 250 pound depth charges, one detonating just 10 meters away. The sound inside the U-boat was deafening and terrifying for the sailors, many of whom had never before been a party to the nerve-destroying experience of being depth charged. The U-boat suffered some light damage from the blast, springing several small leaks which made it into the battery compartment and threatened to release poisonous chlorine gas while a handful of improperly stored torpedoes broke loose from their restraints and went crashing into the deck. Ramlow lost control of his men, who were now gripped with uncontrollable terror. They either thought the U-boat was about to sink, that one of the torpedoes was about to detonate, that they would suffocate from the gas, or that more RAF bombs were about to rain down upon them. Regardless of their motivation, they wanted no further part of this horror. Ramlow ordered the U-boat to surface, and once it emerged from the water, men began emerging on the deck, only to find themselves the subject of gunfire from the orbiting Hudson units, until, to pilot squadron leader James Thompson's utter astonishment, he saw them waving a white flag of surrender. Radioing for assistance, Thompson was soon joined by an RAF Catalina flying boat, which landed on the water near the U-boat to conduct the surrender. Before its arrival, Ramlow threw code books and pieces of his Enigma coding machine over the side to prevent it from falling into British hands, not knowing, of course, that by now, British intelligence had already cracked much of its secrets. Ramlow had also reported his situation to German Naval Command, and Chief of the U-Boats, Admiral Karl Dönitz, ordered any nearby U-Boats to go to the assistance of U-570. The British intercepted this message, and not wanting to lose their prize, ordered a flotilla of ships and aircraft into the area, leading to U-87 being depth charged, trying to reach Ramlow's position, but they managed to escape destruction. A Royal Navy armed trawler, the Northern Chief, arrived on scene with orders to do whatever it took to prevent the German crew from scuttling their vessel, and so its captain informed them that he would shoot anyone he saw trying to sabotage the U-boat. If that failed to force their cooperation, he then informed them that if they did try to sink the U-boat, they would be committing suicide, as he would not attempt to rescue any of them from the freezing waters. Fearing that the Germans would set explosives on the U-boat, the British kept them on board until U-570 could be boarded and searched. Once this was done, the crew were taken off and the U-boat towed to Iceland, where it was beached to prevent it from sinking. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was utterly delighted by the news that a U-boat had been captured relatively intact and demanded that the best minds in the Royal Navy be put to examining it for every possible secret and advantage that could tip the balance of the war at sea in the Allies' favour. Initial inspection of the vessel on the beach in Iceland revealed something puzzling to the British, Specifically, that despite the crew's surrender, the damage was relatively light, and it was concluded that a well-trained crew could have saved themselves and their U-boat from the inglorious fate of capture. 
This was the first clue for the British admirals that all was not well among the U-boat corps, which by now had built up a fearsome reputation that Churchill himself would later admit was the only thing that truly scared him during the war. Interrogations of the crew reinforced this fact. Despite the effort to destroy the code books, many useful papers were still discovered aboard the U-boat, including a captain's handbook, which went some way to helping the British understand German naval procedures, jargon, and references. Soon, the British inspection team was joined by two US Navy officers, who were especially interested in the G7A torpedoes on board, with one of these weapons eventually being shipped back to the United States, despite the country still technically neutral in the war. After repairs had been completed, the U-boats left Iceland on September 29, 1941, bound for the famed Vickers Shipbuilding Yard in Barrow in Furness in northwest England, escorted by two British destroyers to protect it from British aircraft who might mistake it for being under German control, as well as other U-boats. Much was made of the capture in British propaganda, even though it was not the first U-boat to be captured. Previous examples, like the U-110, were kept classified so as not to tip off the Germans that the British had captured vital pieces of the Enigma coding machine. With U-570, there was no need for such secrecy, however, and this was bad news for Ramlow, who found himself put on trial for cowardice and incompetence by his fellow U-boat captains at his prisoner of war camp. Repairs by the Vickers company proved problematic due to unfamiliarity with the U-boat design on the part of the workers, and four torpedoes trapped in the bow as a result of damage from the Hudson's depth charges. A specialist team were tasked with freeing and disarming them, a highly dangerous job, conducted with much of the dock where the U-boat was being held evacuated in case the weapons detonated. The question now was what to do with the U-boat. Churchill himself had several ideas, his preferred being to either hand it over to the Americans, who could study and repair it, sharing the data with the British, while another was to assign it a Yugoslavian crew, who could use it to disrupt German operations in the Adriatic and Mediterranean seas. However, he faced stiff opposition from the Royal Navy, who wanted to retain control of the U-boat for their own research. Thus, the U-boat was repaired to full operational condition to allow it to undertake sea trials in order to assess the full capabilities of the Type 7C. Other trials were more creative and involved scale models being constructed in order to test the effectiveness of new shaped charge anti-submarine bombs, while the control room was meticulously replicated on land to train boarding parties who may be called upon to capture more U-boats in the future. Since it was no longer in the German Navy, the designation U-570 no longer seemed appropriate for a vessel under British command, and so it was commissioned with the name HMS Graf, the G denoting that it was a captured German vessel, while the name being inspired by the volume of diagrams and schematics that had been made of it since its capture. After a year of intense study, it was determined that little more could be learned from HMS Graf, and so having lost its value as a source of intelligence, the British Admiralty felt comfortable enough to release the vessel for active service against its former owners. On October 8, 1942, HMS Graf departed Holy Lock in Scotland for its first war patrol for the Allies, under the command of Lieutenant Peter Barnsley Marriott, who had been involved in much of the U-boat sea trials and was so seen as the best man for the job. During the patrol, the U-boat was cruising northeast of Cape Ortegal, hunting U-boats returning from attacks on Allied ships in the Mediterranean and around North Africa, when it was spotted by a Luftwaffe Focke-Wulf FW200 Condor Maritime Patrol aircraft. The Condor attacked as Marriott ordered Graf to dive, and the U-boat once again narrowly avoided destruction, but as it did so, Graf's hydrophones detected another submarine nearby. Following the sound, Marriott observed through the periscope another German U-boat, U-333, which was attempting to escape back to base after being damaged following a ramming by a British warship. Marriott attacked with four torpedoes, and soon the sounds of detonations convinced him that he had struck his target, claiming the Graf's first victim. However, it would later transpire that this was not the case, as the U-333 evaded the torpedoes, which then proceeded to self-detonate. 
Graf's second patrol began on November 19th, 1942, and involved a search for an Italian ship, the Cortelazzo, which was running over 2,000 tons of machine parts to Japan from France to aid the Japanese war effort in Asia and the Pacific. Graf would fail to locate the Cortelazzo, but the Italian blockade runner would not make it to its destination, being sunk by the British destroyer HMS Redoubt en route. Returning to port in early December, the U-boat was again made ready to sail out of Lerick in the Shetland Islands on Christmas Eve 1942, along with three other British submarines, their target being the German cruiser Admiral Hipper. Operating out of Norway, the Admiral Hipper was tasked with intercepting the vital Russian convoys and was formidably armed compared to the destroyers and light carriers often employed on escort duty. Two days before Graf left port, a convoy designated JW-51B left Scotland, comprising of 14 merchant ships packed with supplies including 202 tanks and 120 combat aircraft, and was protected by a flotilla of destroyers and minesweepers. The Admiral Hipper, along with another cruiser, the Lutzow, and six destroyers, sortied out to intercept, and on December 31st, 1942, engaged the convoy, sinking a British destroyer and a minesweeper. However, before it could do any damage to the vital convoy, a force of nearby British cruisers arrived, prompting the Germans to withdraw. Graf and the other British submarines went in pursuit of the Germans, and Marriott would spy the cruiser through his periscope. However, he was out of position for an attack and was unable to catch the much faster cruiser. He therefore settled for attacking two of the destroyers, launching a spread of four torpedoes at a range of 7,000 yards. And almost repeating what happened with the U-333, Marriott's crew heard the torpedoes detonate, believing they had scored a hit, but in fact they had missed their intended targets and the torpedoes self-detonated. Graf then returned to Lowick, but while the patrol failed in its objective of sinking the Admiral Hipper, the Allies had scored a major success with the whole affair. Hitler was so enraged by his surface fleet's lack of success against the convoys that he ordered much of it to be scrapped and instead focus on building U-boats. Meanwhile, the Royal Navy was learning something else about the Type 7 U-boat with HMS Graf, and that was just how much technical support she required from shore facilities over any extended period of time. Running low on spare parts, especially concerning the batteries which needed to be charged far more regularly than equivalent American or British submarines, HMS Graf was taken off the front lines and instead adopted various training roles which would be less of a strain on her mechanical components. While her career at the front had been anything but spectacular, it had nonetheless contributed greatly to helping defeat the U-boat menace. In February 1944, Graf was taken out of service and used as a target to test the new depth charges on a full-size U-boat. On March 19th, 1944, while under tow from Chatham to Clyde for final scrapping, as if in one final act of defiance, the U-boat's tow line broke in poor weather and the vessel ran aground near Coal Point. There it was abandoned and eventually broken up for scrap, bringing a close to the story of the Royal Navy's U-boat. And there you have the tale of U-570, HMS Graf. Please leave a comment down below with your own thoughts and reactions, and remember to like this video and subscribe to support the channel. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.